Before we begin our presentation, I would just like to begin by saying the act of reproduction is talked about a lot in the story. So when the act of reproduction is referred to, it will be referred to as playing chess. Perfect. The wife is back. starts off with a lady named Alice. Alice had five husbands. Two of them were iffy. Three were all right. Let's get right into it. Gotta get the air. All right, as we all know, during this time period, being chaste and holy and pure was the main goal of a woman. But that's not Alice. Mm -hmm. Alice was the opposite. Anti-church, anti-state, lived for her own freedom. She also didn't have any issue arguing with men over their misogynistic tendencies. She goes on to argue with many people in the Gang of Pilgrims with common misconceptions about women. She clears it right up for them. Preach. When Alice was looking for a suitable mate or whatever, she always had her own self-interest in mind. In other words, she was a gold digger. She also believed that men were to be women's slaves. Women were to have total control over their husbands, and that was the way it was to be. Okay, now introducing Alice's first three husbands. They were really rich and really old. I mean like about to die, like could barely stand old. And that was her blueprint. Alice always was looking for money, land, and close to death money. Now Alice's fourth husband took a mischief, and she did not like that whatsoever. So in retaliation, she went door to door, just entertaining all the men she could find. And that didn't make her very happy. So one day, she went off to Jerusalem, and the fourth husband died in a cave next to a church. And when she got back from Jerusalem, she didn't even pay for the funeral because he did it himself. It's not too bad. Now the fifth husband. The fifth husband was a scholar named Jenkins and was the only husband she married out of love. She married Jenkins right after the death of her fourth husband because she was already having a thing with Jenkins when the fourth husband was around. So, Jenkins had a book, and he loved this book. It went on and on about how being a husband is terrible. And it made him think that he'd rather have a dragon, foul woman, than a nagging wife. Alice was so fed up with this book. One night, Jenkins was reading her some tales out of it, and she was so mad, she went up and ripped three pages out of the book and pushed them into the fire. Jenkins, being pushed into the fire, rage in his fist. He punched Alice so hard she went deaf in one ear, laid out on the ground. Alice was like, I'm gonna play dead. I'm gonna make him think he killed me. Pro move. So Jenkins is like, oh my gosh, you're dead on the ground. What are we gonna do? And Alice, <gasps> this is all your fault. It's all you. So I'm going to take all of your land, all of your wealth, it's going to be in my control because you almost killed me. It's your fault. Yep. And live happily ever after because he submitted to that. Now, the story finally begins after our extra long prologue. Our tale begins with a knight on his way to King Arthur's court. And on his way, he sees a maiden alone in the woods and plays unconsensual chess with her. The countryside can't look at this, and it's outraged. So they petition the king to sentence him to justice. So the king condemns him to death. But the queen steps in and is like, no, 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 I got this. He asked, she asked the knight, do you know what women most desire? The knight's like, no. So the queen sets him out and says, 
If you can find what women most desire, you can have your life back. So he sets out on his journey. He goes place to place, asking every woman what they most desire. Most say treasure and wealth. Others want joy, pleasure. But most wanted flattery and gratitude. But there was no concrete answer. Never a concrete answer. So he heads back, very angry. And on his way back to the court, in the clearing in the woods, he sees 24 beautiful ladies singing and dancing. But as he approaches them, they disappear like magic. And the only creature to remain is an ugly old lady. So the ugly old lady approaches the knight and asks, what's wrong? And he says, well, I'm out trying to figure out what women most desire. And she says, oh, I have your answer, but I'll only give you the answer if after I save your life, you do what I require of you. And he's like, okay, yeah, if you have the answer, let's go. So they travel back to the court of Camelot and go before the queen. The knight's like, I have an answer to your question. The queen's like, spit. So. <laughs> He says, women most desire sovereignty over their husbands. All the ladies in the court couldn't agree more. So he was given his life back. And the request made by the old hag was that the knight marry her for saving his life. So they marry. And on the first night of their wedding, the knight tosses and turns, paying no mind to the ugly hag in the bed with him. So the hag wakes up and is like, is this how you treat your newly wedded wife? Is this how knight treats me? And the knight confesses that due to her ugliness and old age, she's repulsive. So the old hag goes into a long-winded speech about how her being ugly is an asset to him because if she were beautiful, He'd be jealous all the time. And also, she shouldn't get on him for being poor. He shouldn't get on her for being poor because Jesus Christ himself was poor, and so are many leaders of the church. It's a good deal. Finally, the woman gives him an ultimatum. It says, you can either have me beautiful, but unloyal, and have men come to this house for me and not you, or you can have me be ugly, but a good wife and loyal. The knight says, oh, it's up to you. So the woman goes, since it's up to me, kiss me. The knight's like, okay, fine. And when he opens his eyes, it's a beautiful woman, young and beautiful. They live happily ever after, and that's the end of our tale. <laughs>